Hi there, I'm Harry, and you know what this game is. It's the original Legend of Zelda, the one for the NES. Let me ask you something, have you played this game? Like, have you actually sat down and played this game like you would any other video game? Some of you might have been old enough to play it when it came out, but some of you might have played it five years later, ten years later, twenty years later... Thirty years later, oh my goodness, The Legend of Zelda is 36 years old, what are we doing? For those of you who actually have played The Legend of Zelda, and let's be honest, that's not that many of you, you've probably found a frustrating and obtuse experience. Like, you start out getting the sword in the cave, sure, everyone knows that, but where do you go afterwards? It's not like Super Mario Brothers where you can easily figure out where to go, like the whole first level is designed around teaching you the entire game. The Legend of Zelda has none of that. It's confusing and difficult, and I wouldn't be surprised if many people People who picked this up out of curiosity never reached the first dungeon. The Legend of Zelda was revolutionary for the time, but I wouldn't recommend you play it today. Or would I? This game holds a secret, and it's not the secrets that you'll find from bombing walls and burning bushes, no. In fact, the secret lies outside of the game. The Legend of Zelda has an instruction manual. I'm not going to make a whole joke out of this, despite the fact that I am a small baby, I still remember instruction manuals being a thing, and we all know that they're not a thing anymore. Most players can take affordances with how certain aspects of video games work, like joystick controls and saving. That stuff is even leaked out into popular culture. And in the event that a player is completely new to the medium and is playing Death Stranding for the first time, then information about how to play the game is stored within the game itself. Can you imagine though if Death Stranding was someone's first video game? <laughs> That'd be wild. But the instruction booklet for The Legend of Zelda was a bit more detailed than a brief rundown of the controls. It served as a guide. Like, no I'm not joking here, look at this, it tells you what to do. It tells you how to get to the first dungeon, it even tells you how to complete it, what the weaknesses of certain bosses are. The chaotic world of Hyrule is given order through its instruction booklet. And I might be outing myself here as the worst gamer on the planet and even bigger menace to society than I already am, but I didn't know that this was a thing, and I honestly bet a lot of other people didn't know this was a thing either. The main criticism I hear of this game is that you have to bomb every wall and burn every bush, but that's not true. The instruction book helps you in that regard as well. Through this, the instruction booklet is a part of the game. All of a sudden it's way more interesting than I have initially given it credit for, because games don't do this anymore. Anymore. When was the last time you saw a game do this? When passing judgement on a game such as The Legend of Zelda, what do I say? Is it good? I don't know, maybe you might like it. It's difficult to chalk this kind of thing up to age, like I'm never really sure when I think, hmm, this game hasn't aged well, when you could also argue that through intention or not, The Legend of Zelda's clunky combat, awkward translations and confusing world is itself a part of the design. I think it's easy to dismiss these games as prototypes for the games that we love today, or products of their time, but doing that is throwing out a lot of the cool stuff that you don't see games do anymore. Persona 3 is like the, the prime example here, it's janky as hell, right? Like I had to buy um, a new hard drive because I have like, um, I have the PlayStation 3 that has some um, no storage, like the one in that uh, Columbo bit. And when I started playing, it's clear that Persona 3 was like a test bed for the future two games. The social link system feels half-baked, there's not much reward for doing it until the later stages of the game. There's no social links for your party, and the player character is the only person you can control in battle. You can't command anyone else, you just have to see Mitsuru, you use Maren Khan for like the 57th time. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, we have jokes for the Persona 3 fans out there, all two of you. You could say that this is all simply a case of outdated design, that future games quote-unquote fix. But for one, I don't think that's giving the developers enough credit, and two, come on, that's boring as hell, because Persona 3 is like the best one. Probably Persona 5 Real is pretty good. The social links that are there are some of the finest in the series. Not being able to command party members in battle gives them their own sense of individuality. The lack of social links allows them to develop alongside the game's overarching narrative. It feels natural. A party member's development isn't front-loaded towards the start or end of the game like it can be with the other two. Also, I know there are social links for the female party members. Shut up, I'm trying to make a cool video. While it's clear that the Persona formula has been established at this point, and we're very likely going to see Persona 6 feel even more refined, I think there's something that's been lost in translation between the games. It's not something that's necessarily better, but it's still interesting. It's different. Honestly, I think this is why so many people are getting into Elden Ring at the moment. Like, it's, it's good, don't get me wrong, but there are 
are definitely criticisms that you could level at it. And yet the conventions that it does throw out the window, such as having good boss fight animations fight me behind the bike shed after school this Friday, is done so to serve what it's going for. A dark, unforgiving world that needs to be approached unconventionally through collaboration and experimentation. By the way, um, I just want to clear something up here. I'm, I'm building like a reputation on the internet as someone who doesn't like Elden Ring because uh, I made a 10 second joke about it. Uh, that's not true, okay? I like Elden Ring a lot. I think it's a good game. It was a joke. 7 out of 10 is a perfectly reasonable score for a video game. Okay, what do these two random thoughts of The Legend of Zelda and its instruction manual and cool video games doing cool things that are different have to do with the title of the video where I talk about Tunic, when I've not even mentioned the name Tunic yet? What's going on here? Well, that's what Tunic is. The main focus, the main idea of the game is to bring the instruction manual of The Legend of Zelda kicking and screaming into the hellscape that is 2022. But there's a small problem with taking a thing, an idea from a piece of art and applying it to your own art, is that you have to know what you're doing. Doing this is hard, this is really, really hard. If you want to pay homage to something, then you have to know why you want that. You have to bring a unique twist to the table, and unfortunately, there are games out there that you can tell are heavily influenced by a certain game, and even try hard with their innovations, but fall just short, as they don't quite get what made its muse so special. Which is why I was so apprehensive with the first few hours of Tunic, because like, what is it doing? You wake up and you go to places and like there's a there's a stick and you can explore stuff, go off the beaten path, get beaten off on the beaten path and <sighs> everything is here. The controls feel nice, the music is relaxing, the combat is is there, it works, it's not terrible. I know some people weren't a fan of the combat in this game. I, I think it's serviceable, it's fine. The manual holds some interesting enough secrets so far, but in these first couple of hours, what is Tunic going for? What does it feel like? It doesn't feel like The Legend of Zelda. It feels like, wait for it, <laughs> Dark Souls. It's the Dark Souls of Zelda. Oh no. Okay, okay, hear me out, right? Uh, you can you can roll in combat. Uh, there are iframes. You can lock onto enemies, um, and enemies drop little cubes when they die, and when you and, and you can pick them up. And like if you die, you drop your cubes. Um, there's bonfires that you can that you can light to respawn at, and you can uh, level your stats there. Uh, there's bosses with big health bars and complicated attack patterns. Also, you have to ring two bells at the start of the game. That's it, that's the video, see you all next. Obviously, I'm joking. This has all of the trappings of Dark Souls, all of the stuff that's in Dark Souls, but it's not Dark Souls, because Dark Souls is more than all of these things. A dark, unforgiving world that needs to be approached unconventionally through collaboration and experimentation. This doesn't feel like a Zelda game. I don't feel any call to adventure. The music is great, don't get me wrong, but it's not bold, it's not exciting. There aren't any classics here like you'd get with basically any other Zelda game. The music needs to go like at least 30% harder. Like this is probably the hardest that the, the music of Tunic gets. That plays during a boss fight. In Zelda, you need someone to save, some kind of motivation, which isn't really there with Tunic. At the start, you don't even know what your goal is. Ring the bells? I mean, yeah, okay. Uh, is this intentional? Probably. Is it good? Eh. So like, what's going on here? How do we solve the curious case of what Tunic wants to be? Is it a case of mistaken identity? Does it want to be Dark Souls? Does it want to be Zelda? Am I actually being a stupid idiot that has no idea what he's talking about? It's just that Tunic uses Dark Souls mechanical ideas as a base to make a game that fully develops into what it wants to be past the first few admittedly disappointing hours? Yeah, it's the third one. Where is the focus of the game? It's on the instruction booklet. I think everybody would agree that it's the instruction booklet, but I guess the problem is that, you know, you have to give it a build up. You can't just start doing weird stuff right away. There has to be some kind of mystery to it. Some of it is cool, like, look here, this is telling you how to sprint, or this one is telling you how iframes work. Most of it is just how to play the game though, nothing too exciting. But then you find more pages dotted around the world and all of a sudden it's not about teaching you the game anymore. It's getting to the magic of the original Legend of Zelda. It's teaching you how to beat the game. Whether Zelda and its obtuseness was intentional is up for debate, but here it most undoubtedly is, that's the point. When does this hit you? Well, I'd say it's this page right here. Oh, by the way, this isn't like a, a huge reveal, but if you want to go into this game knowing nothing about it, then you should probably stop watching. I'll give you like three seconds, okay? Three, two, one. All right. If you seek to increase your power, what must you do? You must offer up trinkets and items found over the land to the fox. 
goddess statue thing you offer like a tooth or something and then you get um, more powerful that's how you upgrade your stats in this game it's an essential part of the game and you can only do that by passing the meaning derived from the instruction manual this adds an extra dimension to tunic it's doing something different using material that is supposed to exist outside of that magic circle of a video game's world and bringing it to the fold it's a part of the game itself through this, the player is becoming a participant in the game's story, a guiding hand for our little fox. There's a sense of mystery within this instruction manual that reverberates throughout the entire game. The world itself has a lot of similarities to the original Zelda with a splash of Metroidvania for good measure. It's clear a lot of attention and care went into making this world, one full of branching paths and secrets, some of which are hidden in plain sight while others lurk in the nooks and crannies. Much of Tunic's world is gated off by progress, you need a sword to chop down these bushes, like that's the simplest example of this. But beyond that, Tunic's world is gated by player knowledge. It calls back to games like Outer Wilds and Return of the Obra Dinn, games that hinge entirely upon a player's knowledge in order to be completed. You can beat Outer Wilds in 30 minutes if you know what you're doing, but that's the thing, you won't. There are things that you can do in Tunic that you don't know that you can do. God, that's a, that's a sentence. And when you find out that you can do these things, that is where the magic happens. In a contrasting yet similar way to Oberdin, Tunic has you make deductions on what to do based on the contents of the manual. There's many things that are discovered by what limited information you currently have. Like, okay, take the simplest one. Um, you can hold A after a roll to sprint. That's how you sprint in this game. And you might not know this. I heard from one person that didn't know this until someone told them. So it's not exactly a flawless model of discoverant gameplay. God, I'm just making up words. But there's a great feeling of satisfaction when you do get it right, when you do figure it out. And there is a lot to figure out. It's also like a really good Zelda game, like just on its own, even with the mixes to the formula, like top three, maybe top four. Granted, I'm not like the biggest fan of Zelda, I passed on Ocarina of Time, I, I don't think that one's for me, and I haven't played um, uh, Majora's Mask anyway, but that's that's not the point. The point is, it's a good Zelda game, it gets the, the zelda -y parts of, of Zelda as well, like it follows a, a similar structure, like, uh, you know, do this thing at the start, collect the, the three magical gems, uh, get the magical sword, you don't actually get a magical sword this time, there's no, there's no magical sword, just a, a regular sword, and then um, face off against the final... <laughs> <laughs> See, I, ne I nearly spoiled it then, I nearly spoiled it. Tunic takes a turn after this, and we're gonna have to get into spoilery territory as well as bring up some other cool things that I, I don't want to ruin for you if you want to play the game. So, like, now is, you know, the other side of the airlock in a sense, y you know, the final barrier. I'm gonna be spoiling everything. So go and go and play the game, uh, career my analytics off a cliff, you know, it it's on Game Pass, have fun. So, like, okay, Tunic. There's, there's a nice variety of locations, right? There's a, there's a forest, a cool temple, beach place, a nice swamp, a uh, graveyard, and you think, okay, cool. These locations are pretty normal and in line with what I would expect from a Zelda game. And then you get to the quarry, and these little guys mining here, and they have, they have guns. And they can kill you pretty easily, and they're mining this purple stuff coming out of the ground that lowers your health. Like, it doesn't do damage, it lowers your max health. It's creepy. Everything else in this game only vaguely suggests an industrialization of any kind. And here it delivers. It's a linear part of the game, and definitely the most boring part if you're playing it for the second time, but for newcomers this is the most captivating part of the game. It's a straight shot into the mines where you keep going, into the belly of the beast. And oh, oh no. Oh no. This is pretty messed up. Why am I talking about this? I don't really know. I just thought, um, you know, we'd be on the same page here that this is not okay. I do not like this. Boss in the area is really hard um, to kill and annoying, and I think you're, you're meant to kill the librarian first. Um, but I never did, so, so yeah. That's that's a that's a thing about the game as well. You're given a lot of freedom in the order in which you approach the game, but that can also mislead players into thinking they need to tackle a certain area when they should do something else first. But, you know, if it's good enough for Dark Souls. So yeah, this is it. The suggestion that there is something more sinister lurking beneath the surface, literally, in this case, of a video game. A twist, if you will. A subversion of expectations. When you face off against the final boss, you... Well, you don't. It's not even a contest. You get destroyed, and you have to go around as a, as a stupid ghost with all of your stats taken away from you. I know there are certain people out there that don't like it when this happens, when all of your mechanics uh, get taken away, but I think it's fine here, as you get to keep your items. It's about the mastery of your items this time around, rather than managing your stats. And plus, you get your stats back anyway, along with this um, anime teleport. Jesus crown thing. So, what do you do now? Do you gain all of your stats back and fight the boss? Sure, it's it's a hard boss, 
Probably, I don't know, I never fought it. I'll probably get some footage. But this game holds yet another secret. That's right, I'm talking about the golden path. There's a big door here and it's very difficult to open. How do you open it? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's time to collect all of the pages of the manual. There's another secret hidden in this manual and that's the Holy Cross. Look at this fox sitting in front of the door, all confused. That's you, you idiot. These weird doors that you see lying around the game world, you can open them with your D-pad. I wish it wasn't called the D-pad. It's not, it's not a word with a lot of, uh, a lot of gravitas to it. But yeah, you can open doors with your D-pad. Look, down, right, up, left, up, right, boom, it's open. And look, there's secrets inside or extra pages or whatever. And this is really cool. Figuring this out is really cool. This is a classic example of Tunic requiring the player to use their knowledge about the game in creative ways in order to beat it. But we're not done there. To get to the true ending of Tunic, you have to find all the fairies. How do you find the fairies? You use the d-pad. Look, you can use the d-pad to find where the fairies are. There's one here, for example. Then you use the d-pad to solve whatever puzzle lies wherever you are. Some of these puzzles are really hard. You have to think outside the box. Some of them require you to write the solution down on some paper. Paper. Some of them require you to write the solution down on some paper. You have to write the solution on some paper. Some of them require you to write the solution down on some paper. That's not me sewing sewing the voice that that's me talking slowly by the way but how are you idiot you fool you failure of a human being the witness did this and you said it was bad but now we're talking about tunic and how tunic does this and you're just about to say how good it is how a game that uses your knowledge of its world and its rules is great what's going on here is this channel just an elaborate way to constantly dunk on the witness all of the time as much as possible <laughs> Look, it's all about contextualizing what's going on here, combined with your preferences and expectations of what you want a video game to be. Because Tunic, in the last six hours or so, goes from an action-adventure game, whatever that means, to a puzzle game. Now, contrary to popular belief, I like puzzle games. I like the one that recently came out where you have to you have to go into the boxes. I've forgotten the name of it because puzzle games have the worst names uh, on the planet. Like, I could make one called Harry's Heroic horticulture and, and it's like a puzzle game about gardening or something and it would it would sell like a million copies but you dear viewer might not like puzzle games and you especially might not like puzzle games when they show up uninvited at 3am talking about the holy cross and the fairies for me it was a welcome surprise but it might not be for you Solving all of these awkward, obtuse puzzles where you, in a lot of cases, have to write down the solution on a piece of paper might not be your bag. But allow me to hit you with the Elden Ring defense, okay? Okay, here it comes. Are you ready? <coughs> uh, yeah? That's the point? You idiot? You moron? You fool? Tunic harkens back to the days of secrets in games, a time before the internet where you couldn't be sure what was fact or what was fiction about like a game, I mean, not 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 in general. <laughs> of course, it's gonna have to be a bit annoying. You're gonna have to think outside the box and experiment. I think all of these puzzles are fairly reasonable. The only time I got mad was figuring out I had to bomb this wall because it's not really suggested as far as I can tell. It is it is like a thing in the game, but it's not necessary to progress up to this point. And the only hint is that you do it in the original Zelda. Puzzles towards the later stages of Tunic have to be difficult because you wouldn't feel very accomplished. Otherwise, oh look, here's a video that you can watch if you've, if you've not seen that one, please. At the same time, when is it okay to stop? Is it intended that everyone who plays this game and finishes this game is meant to get to this point? If you decide to stop playing here, are you going to be satisfied? Probably not, right? But the problem is this game has shifted gears from something that the player might like into something the player might hate. And I understand that, I get that. You could argue that it's still in line with the game's mysterious nature, but I don't know, it's kind of like, um, it's like going to McDonald's, right? If you're going you're, you're going to McDonald's and you ask for a big tasty, um, and they give you some nuggets or something, and the people behind the counter is like, ah, come on now, it's still, it's still McDonald's, you came here for McDonald's, why are you complaining? I don't know if anyone's actually gonna have this argument, I just wanted to talk about the big tasty. Anyway, in the same way that a uh, player's like of the witness stems on whether they think drawing out grids is good or not. Your enjoyment of Tunic is going to hinge on whether on this page of the manual you go ah or ah 
What am I doing? But we're not done here. Oh no, we're not done here at all. The Golden Path is not about finding the fairies. No, that's just a single step in this whole thing. We have to open the door. Yeah, the door in the mountains, the door that's um that's made out of gold. You have to open by by doing um um Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you. I thought this was maths. I thought you had to like make um you had to make numbers by putting in certain combinations into the D-pad with this weird octopus thing. Turns out you don't have to do that. There's, so there's something completely different that is. Uh, for hidden in these very pages of the manual is the combination that you seek. On page 12 here, you might see a familiar pattern. Take a look. Ugh. Oh, I don't have enough space on this desk. Oh, what a mistake. Hang on. Uh. Okay, that's step one. Yeah, this is easily the best puzzle in all of video games. It's so good. It takes the rules that you've learned about the game, the Holy Cross, the manual, the fact that there's hidden information at every turn, and gets you scouring every inch of the book like some kind of conspiracy theorist. You print off grids in Excel, you get to work filling it in. You print off another grid because you messed up the first one. Figuring out the secret of each page is nothing short of a delight. It's so good. It's so unbelievably good. Once you solve the puzzle, the door mechanically unfolds. Open, I can't remember who actually does that. You reach the inside and what lies in wait but the first page of the manual like the the cover page it says thank you for playing the game and then you get to give the manual to the final boss at the end and and that's it that's the good ending yeah the journey the journey is probably better than the the destination on this one <laughs> There's a new game plus mode where you can play the game again with all the knowledge that you have. And I highly recommend it. It's uh, it's really good. I beat it in like an hour. It's a lot of fun. And that's it. That's that's the end of Tunic. Right? That's the end of Tunic. There's other kinds of secrets in this game. It's not just the fairies. You can find these crystal chests. They have these little items which you can place in the room behind the house and the secrets are hinted at in the manual. And if you get enough of them, you get taken to this tower where these glyphs show up. And okay, there's no easy way to break this. You can translate the language. You can translate the language, the, like these symbols mean different things phonetically and you can translate them into English and you have to ask the question uh, that I asked earlier, at what point do you say fuck it and throw the game directly into the bin? I have it on Game Pass, I, I can't actually throw it in the bin, I'm, I'm sorry. At what point are you meant to start collaborating with people? Is every player expected to translate the language themselves? I mean, sorry, like, I have a full-time job, I've got things to do. Even so, I spent like two hours making a website that translates the language. tuniktranslation.videogames.co.uk, you're welcome, there might be a few mistakes in the translation, I didn't test it. I felt like I had to do something at this point, and that wasn't just taking what everyone else had done. But that's me really, really getting into the mystery of this game. I don't think anyone should do this. The best thing I can say is that there's no other game that would have made me do this. Is that good? I don't know. At the very least, it's interesting. As long as it's worth it. It's not worth it. It's an arg. Like, you, you have to do the golden path backwards on this tower and then translate the glyphs and it takes you to this website and it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's an arg. And don't get me wrong, ARGs are cool when they've been solved and you can spend like 20 minutes reading about it in a Google Doc. An ARG for Tunic is both fitting and incredibly disappointing at the same time. It's not been solved yet, as far as I'm aware, and it's at this point where I did stop playing and, you know, did something else. And I don't know, I would have liked a big boss to fight, like a Sans Undertale sort of deal for those who are really dedicated to the game and wanting to uncover every last secret. At the same time, I can understand why this isn't the thing, because why would you want to make such a heavy investment to something that so few players are going to see? And that's it for Tunic. God, can you imagine if there like is a hidden boss somewhere at the end of the arc? I doubt it, honestly. Whew, that's a, a bit disappointing. Can you imagine that? Like a piece of media just ending all of a sudden no, don't worry it's fine don't worry. i'm not gonna end the video all of a sudden that would be funny though okay let's wrap things up it's difficult to say what kind of judgment we should pass on tunic because it's highly dependent on whether you like where it goes and sure that's like you know how opinions work we could say that for every game but honestly not every game is like tunic not every game takes the 180 that it does Maybe that's why I like it so much. You don't often see a game that brings a relic from a time forgotten into the modern day and also executes on that idea really well. It's my game of the year so far, for sure. It's pretty good. You know, for a video game. Hi there, thank you for watching this very slightly longer than I usually make video.
If you like this and you want to see more, there are other videos of mine that you can see that you could be watching right now. Too many, really. Um, there's one on Breath of the Wild and how we're all going to die. Uh, there's one on 15 seconds of gameplay from Return of the Aberdeen. A real selection of stuff, you should check it out. And of course, if you want to see more, then do the things that feed YouTube's algorithms, such as liking the video and subscribing and leaving a comment. Uh, you know, telling me what you thought of Chinook or something. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, that's it for now. I will see you all later. Take care.